You're watching the humble beginnings of electronic banking, an invention process still evolving throughout the world. That 20-year process has been hammered and forged by exploding technologies and tempered by the inadequacies and frailties of the inventors. We have passed over a torturous trail that brings us to this very point in the history being written about the worldwide development of electronic banking services. I want to share with you my observations of this sometimes stumbling journey in the hope that this presentation will help us focus on where we have been in order to better chart where we're going. Let me also say in advance that these materials are those in which I've had first-hand experience and in which my bank has been involved. I'm not attempting to slight anyone or any other projects. There were many that contributed to this electronic development. It's just that I happen to only have old movies of our projects. Let me return now to that early development. It proved to be the taproot of electronic banking. This is the beginning of the international credit card system, which over the last two decades has stimulated and organized the invention process. This early authorization center answered merchant phone calls by looking up the customer balance from computer printouts. This rather cumbersome system, of course, predated the online system, which evolved by the end of the 60s. But this is how it started. There was another phenomenon worth noting from those early invention process. This early authorization center answered merchant phone calls by looking up the customer balance from computer printouts. This rather cumbersome system, of course, predated the online system, which evolved by the end of the 60s. But this is how it started. There was another phenomenon worth noting from those early days. Thousands. This plastic card, and thousands more just about like it, introduced not only a self-service convenient way to borrow, but a guaranteed payment system available worldwide. The card went through many early enhancements, including this Polaroid card, which carried a full color picture of the consumer. These were mostly marketing efforts to increase the popularity of the plastic card. But by the beginning of the 70s, the next major root of this electronic development began to sprout. I'm referring, of course, to the introduction of magnetics that added machine-readable capability to the plastic. The requirement for machine-readable was first discussed in the MAPS report, the Monetary and Payment Systems Study, commissioned by the ABA in 1968. It predicted a mountain of paper swamping the future processing ability of the banking industry, similar to what had just happened in the brokerage business, and called for the immediate and massive movement to what later became known as the checklist cashless society. The first application for magnetics, the adopted standard of both banking and the airline industry, was to be at point of sale, since obviously that's the location of the major paper problem. I want to show you how that began. This is post one, point of sale terminal one. The first use of a magnetic stripe card at point of sale, installed in Columbus as a joint venture with IBM. This is the IBM 2730. Later it was used in the famous Hinky Dinky project in Nebraska. As you watch this transaction, you'll notice the terminal has an audio response capability attached to the phone system through an acoustic coupler. We installed 60 terminals in 30 merchants in two different shopping centers and captured the sales data of the Bank America card transaction. You'll notice once the clerk receives the authorization, it is then necessary to process the transaction through the imprinter in order to generate a copy for the customer. Post One demonstrated three requirements for future point of sale. First, the terminal needed printing capability. Second, the credit card was simply not going to be enough the debit card would have to be issued to replace the check. And third, financial organizations would have to share in the service. Well, after uh, several years of hard work, Post 2 was finally ready. This is now uh, 1972. This time, the switch and processing center was to be provided by the Cleveland and the Atlanta Federal Reserve Banks. The Fed had been urged to modify Regulation J, 
Regulation J is a regulation that enables the Fed to handle the checking system. And modification through Reg J would be necessary to handle electronics. Well, uh, modification to Regulation J was rejected by our banking industry, also by the Justice Department. And that pretty well foreclosed the Fed, even to this day, from operating electronic point-of-sale systems. The terminal that had been chosen was the AMCAT, manufactured by Addressograph Autograph. Later, this terminal was to be used by the Honest Face organization in Atlanta. It was operated as a leased line terminal with machine imprinting of the sales draft. Multiple cards, including even oil company cards, were proposed since switching was planned. Post 2 was never introduced because mostly of the Reg J issue and because of the belief that printing a customer receipt rather than imprinting a sales draft was the future. Finally, by 1976, Post 3 was ready, this time using the IBM 3608, a printing terminal that also promised to not only prepare the sales draft, but authorize a check as well. 120 terminals were introduced in 70 supermarkets in Columbus that permitted credit and debit card authorization and check guarantee. The terminals were the first to be operated by the consumer, and that, of course, demonstrated that even a complex device could prove workable. Well, after 10 million transactions and two years of effort, the program was discontinued. Post 3 simply could not be made profitable. There was no sharing, even though encouraged, and also there were no controls of the consumer loss problem because no pins had been issued to the debit card. That was 1978. But we concluded after about uh, 10 years of effort that point of sale was an idea whose time had not yet come. We also believed that sharing, switching, printing, and pens would be eventually introduced in the right package. This is an artist's concept of the kind of checkout system that we felt eventually would be appearing in the marketplace in merchant stores that would cause point of sale to arrive finally as an important electronic delivery system. Of course, that's now beginning to happen within our industry as momentum is once again beginning to build around a major point of sale effort. Before I review that with you, I want to return now to the mid-70s and pick up another offshoot of the plastic card. The first debit card usable at merchant stores was the Visa Entree card introduced in 1977. This card, which was treated identical to the credit card, generated a sales draft in place of a check at the merchant store. Typically, it was also usable in the bank's automatic teller machine program. About four million of these cards were issued and are still available from both Visa and MasterCard today. The real debit card development, however, began with the automatic teller machine in 1971. And that phenomenon has triggered the creation of the debit card networks of today that are still evolving are in our industry and are going to be so important to our future. Let me take you back now to that beginning. The early machines were cash vendors and were accessed by the credit card. The total teller, and therefore a debit card, did not arrive until 1972. There were only a couple of hundred machines installed throughout the United States by the beginning of 1973. But a few banks believed in the future of electronic delivery and as a result began inventing new kinds of branch facilities to exploit this new development. This branch, which featured no lobby, housed two automatic teller machines, one of which was available from the automobile. The automatic banking machine, permitting customers to handle all routine transactions, adds the new dimension, permitting banking to enter an era of delivering service without requiring a lobby transaction. These types of bank buildings, including auxiliary facilities, will deliver service where and when the customer needs and wants it. That, after all, has to be our purpose. When supplemented with pre-arranged banking services and aggressive business development programs, and complemented by existing full service facilities, the Bank 24 system is truly a better way of delivering banking services. 
This type of branch was the forerunner of the off-premise automatic telemachine facilities popular in many parts of our country today. By 1974, however, a new kind of automatic telemachine was being made available to the industry. The first in-lobby automatic telemachines arrived, and they began to further change the branch facility concept. Now, banking could begin experimenting with the direct replacement of the live teller. This bank lobby featured 12 automatic teller machines and no teller's counter. This was the Borden Building branch, which not only first introduced in lobby terminals, but also introduced online balance inquiry and data capture. The opening of the Borden Building branch represents a significant step in providing self-service banking. It is a start, but we need to know much more about the customer's willingness to accept and our ability to provide this type of banking. We can learn much from the basic concepts employed here, such as this sit-down teller's environment. Certainly there is much to learn also about encouraging and teaching customers how to use sophisticated banking machines. It's one thing for a customer to occasionally use a 24-hour through-the-wall machine. It's something totally different to expect a customer to always use an in-lobby device. Clearly, for a while at least, it's not practical to expect a high percentage of customers to automatically use the banking machines. Some won't carry plastic cards, some don't like machines, some just like to talk with tellers. Those are reasons why the sit-down tellers complement the automated teller machines. Had the typical teller's counter been installed in place of the sit-down desks, it would have been more difficult to switch the customer to the self-service machines. A limited service counter is provided primarily for commercial customers. Potentially, this cluster of machines in the lobby of the building proper will prove most important. These machines provide 24-hour banking and do not require the customer to come into the bank lobby for service. It is the machine, however, that's at the heart of self-service banking. And the trigger for the machine is the machine-readable card. How many live tellers can provide this simple service in 17 seconds? You're seeing a customer receive an up-to-the-minute checking account balance. In the process, the customer is identified and the balance will be actually printed on a receipt. Now that's banking that's different. It's banking that's better. And it's the beginning of many more self-service installations designed to provide routine banking service, but more conveniently and at a lower cost. It's not just different. In the long run, it's better. In the uh, 10 years since that facility was first opened, our industry has made some major progress in utilizing teller replacement equipment. There's one other architectural result of this electronic development, and that was the early efforts to install automatic teller machines off-premise. The effort was to take banking out to the customer, rather than to always require the customer to come to the bank. This was the Auto Bank, 1978. It housed an automatic teller machine and was generally located at the self-service gasoline station and, of course, at other sites where limited service could be provided. Of course, now our industry is starting to write another chapter to this exciting electronic delivery system. That chapter b will be written by the installers of massive national, even international electronic networks linking automatic teller machines and point-of-sale terminals into a system that permits the customer to have electronic access from virtually everywhere. We are inventing, as you know, although in fragmented pieces, a universal electronic delivery system. Our view is that this universal service can best be implemented by a universal plastic card, a card that can be used virtually anywhere in any machine. That's precisely why we have recently taken the next step down this stumbling and poorly marked trail toward electronics. We have recently introduced Jubilee as our automatic teller machine service using the Visa Electron Card.
In addition to accessing the automatic telemachine network, Jubilee will also soon become a point of sale direct debit card usable in our local market and then on a national basis through interchange as the Visa service expands. Since the Electron card carries multiple reading technologies, including magnetics, OCR, and the universal barcode, we expect to be able to install yet this year the next generation of point of sale. Maybe this time, post four, will prove to be the right idea at the right time. This uh, history of electronic banking is far from complete. We're probably only in the uh, midpoint of the staggering effort, 20 years behind us and at least we hope 20 years yet to go before our industry has learned to effectively install and operate electronic banking for the mass market. You can already see the next development arriving with its promise of delivering low cost and convenient banking into the home. I'm talking, of course, about video text technology and the opportunity for banking to participate in this next revolution as home automation evolves throughout the world during the balance of this century. Our interest in home banking began in 1979 with the introduction of Channel 2000, a three-month experiment in 200 homes in Columbus to determine the banking service that could be delivered through this startling, almost scary technology. After the experiment, we concluded that home delivery was the next electronic development. We began an effort, which just recently was concluded, and produced our new joint venture concept called Video Financial Services, in which a group of seven banks proposed to establish a national data processing service to deliver home banking through any video text network operator. A financial gateway service we have begun in Florida in connection with Viewtron, the Knight Ritter operated video tech service, and we believe that we are launching once again into a massive new electronic delivery system. This brief section of a presentation about our newest electronic banking effort will describe our service. Let me redirect my comments now to delivering financial services through this distribution system. Clearly, that's one of the exciting opportunities for video techs. Some are predicting that home banking will be the most important ongoing service. It'll be the most important reason people continue to use the information service once they buy a terminal. So while I'm still hooked up to this network, let me demonstrate some of the banking services being made available through video financial services. To gain access to banking, a personal identification code must be used. The code will be chosen by the customer in the bank lobby when they sign up for the service. This is similar to how banks issue ATM security codes today. Now, I've called up the main banking index, which allows the customer to choose from eight different accounts and permits access to the bill payment or customer service sections. You can see the name of the bank and the bank's logo appears across the top of the frame. The bank can also choose any color to surround the data. I'm displaying the checking account information now, which would include all checks and deposits posted to the account at the close of business yesterday, in addition to the current balance. The customer can also review the full statement, which is identical to the statement that's mailed each month. Incidentally, these same screen displays are also available for the customer's savings accounts. While I'm displaying data on the checking and savings accounts, let me show you one other frame. Now this display allows the customer to enter a stop payment or even to reorder new checks. This is just an example of some of the data that can be displayed and some of the routine services that will make it easier for customers to do their banking in the future. That, after all, is the whole idea behind this home information development, making it easier for people to do things. The best way to demonstrate that is to show you some of the bill payment services. This is going to be one of the most significant services offered by the banks of the future. This is the bill payment index that allows the customer to review or cancel pending payments. It also provides access to various screen displays that permit the customer to review or add to a list of the typical merchants to be paid. 
Now, all of us have routine bills to be paid every month that can be handled through this system. In addition, the customer will have a special list of merchants that can be changed at any time and can be paid through the bank's bill payment service. As you can see, this service is patterned after the telephone bill payment services that developed in the banking industry during the past five years. It was only partially successful due to the high cost of handling and the difficulty of using a telephone handset to send messages to a computer. Now, this video text equipment promises to change that and eventually will make it more economical to pay bills in this fashion than to write checks, put them in an envelope with a stamp on them and give them to the mailman as we do today. The economics of electronic bill payment will become even more significant as the banking industry begins to utilize the automated clearinghouse to handle the transaction. Well, there's uh, not much left to say from those early beginnings almost 20 years ago to what we have just seen. has certainly been a gigantic leap from the restrictive and tedious paper-bound banking systems of the past. We have a tremendous challenge ahead of us to finish this electronic invention. We have a wonderful start. I'm urging you to watch this space for coming attractions. They're going to be fantastic. Thank you.